Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends. Today in this lecture we are going to start a new concept that is power and we are going to have three lectures on um, this concept which is one of the essentially contested concepts in political theory as we have been discussing uh, while we uh, discussed the concept of liberty, justice, equality, rights and power is uh, something which is uh, very central in theorization, in understanding or uh, for those who are participating in the politics. So, the politics is also seen or understood as a power game. Uh, it is about um, a location of power and who gets what and how, under what uh, circumstances and so on. So, uh, power is very central to the politics. However, the understanding or the conceptualization of power is essentially contested. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss this essentially contested nature of power and we will try to have some understanding of power. And uh, while concluding this uh, topic in um, uh, coming lectures, we will uh, deeply or in a very detailed manner try to understand the most radical understanding of uh, power through Foucault. However, uh, usually pow power and its uh, different understanding we will uh, see as a kind of introduction to this topic power and then we will try to <coughs> see the relationship between power and authority which we often use in our conversation interchangeably. However, there is a deep uh, uh, difference between the uh, concept of power and authority, but there are all, uh, also some overlaps between these, uh, these two terms. So, we will try to understand first what is power and introduction to it, then we will try to understand what is authority and then finally, um, uh, in the last part of today's lecture we will see the relationship between power and authority. So, uh, the concept of uh, power is understood in political theory as an essentially contested concept. So, as I have argued that power is very central to politics or to understanding of uh, politics and yet the concept of power is essentially contested concept. So, its meanings are varied and often contested and it is simultaneously or interchangeably used with authority as well. In usual normal day to day conversation we see power as some kind of ability or the capacity to do something or to act upon something. So, uh, the power in uh, general commonsensical sense understood as ability or capacity to do something. It is also understood in theory as hegemony, a term that is coined by Antonio Gramsci and we will discuss it in details when we will discuss different conception of power. So, um, there are ways through which power is exercised and power is usually seen as a kind of having coercive dimension to it. That means, somebody has the capacity to do something or to get something done by other even against their will. So, here the coercive dimension of power is quite obvious. In contrast to this coercive dimension of power or understanding of power, we have uh, conceptualization of power as hegemony in Gramsci where he argues 
that power also prevails through the use of ideology of particularly those who are powerful and dominant and it proliferates in the society among the subordinate classes. So, the Gramscian conceptualization of power as hegemony is about getting the consent of those over whom the dominant class or the ruling class exercise their, uh, uh, their rule. So, that consent is acquired not through the use of coercive power, but through the ideological power. So, that is the one kind of understanding of power which we will discuss in details. Now, Michel Foucault talks about power as productive and knowledge as power. This relationship between knowledge and power and the productive or the creative uh, dimension of power we will discuss in details and he put forward these uh, two specific kinds of power which is called disciplinary power and governmental power. So, power as hegemony which we have discussed through Gramsci. His understanding of power will be discussed in the next lecture while dealing with the theories of knowledge and power. So, which determines the what is it the knowledge which enables or gives the individual or those who have knowledge the power or it is the other way around power which determines what constitute knowledge in the first place. So, these interrelationship between knowledge and power we will discuss in the next lectures where we will also discuss Michel Foucault conceptualization of power. So, however, the modern state which has monopoly of legitimate violence. Now, you understand this uh, power or the monopoly of violence um, that is exercised by the state. It can by following the procedure established by law take away the life of its a citizen that is death penalty in many countries are given lawfully, legitimately through following the judicial procedures. However, the state has the legitimate right to take away one's life also. So, it exercises the legitimate violence or the it monopolizes the violence. So, the violence that is exercised by state is only regarded as legitimate violence, all the other forms of violence are regarded as violation of laws or uh, as an opposition uh, to the state. So, modern state makes explicit the use of power and its exercise through various institutions. It also describes the use of physical coercion or punishments to maintain law and order or rule of law in democratic states. So, uh, the role of police, army, paramilitary forces, Im, um, prison and other uh, coercive apparatus of a state are uh, uh, examples of this explicit use of coercive power by the state. However, the abuse and misuse of power and position lead to authoritarian, autocratic or dictatorship form of government. Now, the state which we will discuss when we will discuss this topic state and sovereignty uh, which monopolizes the legitimate means of violence may uh, also become undemocratic or uh, totalitarian or completely auth authoritarian dictatorship. Now, challenge therefore, is to ensure that uh, the power and the authority and more so when we will discuss this power and authority dichotomy, where we will see that authority is something which is seen as legitimate, but the exercise of the authority requires power and there the relationship between the two power and authority is not that clear or not that uh, separate or uh, independent from each other, they are the overlap also. So, the modern state which has exercised um, um, monopoly of violence, the chances are those who are in the authority of power or in the position of uh, authority, they may use and abuse the power of the state and turn a democratic state with its legitimate means of violence to some kind of authoritarian, autocratic or dictatorship form of government. The history of modern world is full of such examples where the power of the state is concent was concentrated in the hands of few individuals or one individual 
and they turn the democratic state into a form of military junta or authoritarian undemocratic state. So, let us come back to this idea of power which is understood as the ability to perform actions or to do something or conduct someone else life through social interaction and communication. So, power in society operates through interactions between more than one individual. So, uh, you can only identify power and its effect when there are more than two or at least two people interact. So, in their interaction, who tries to control whom, under what conditions or on what grounds are the reflection of power and refle uh, power is something which is much more deeper in the uh, structures of society in its interactions, in its communication. So, the relationship between son and father or teacher and the student or patient and the doctor uh, are the relationship between the power. So, the interactions and the communication between two and more people are examples where we can see the exercise or effect of power. So, the most basic definition of power is provided by Robert Dahl who defines power as A that means an individual has power over B the another individual to the extent that A can get B to do something that B would not have otherwise do. So, in this uh, definition of Robert uh, Dahl, it uh, defines power as domination of one person over the other, where a particular person can be regarded as exercising power over another person to the extent that this person can get that person to do something which that person would not do otherwise. So, uh, this definition of power explains two specific things about power. First, here power is seen as individual attribute that means one individual exercise that power over the another individual. So, power has individual attributes or feature that defines how individual exercise power over other individual. The second power here is seen as domination as some kind of control or domination or subordination of one over the other. So, power is seen mostly in a negative domination uh, in the sense of domination that is power is used to make others to do what one wants against their own will. So, the consent over whom the power is exercised does not matter when power is exercised so uh, and power is seen as domination. So, the subordinates what they feel hardly matters when the superior want them to get something done even if they willingly are not in favor of doing that thing. So, power in this most basic simplistic sense is seen as domination. Now, in contrast to this understanding of power as domination, many theorists have argued about the structural or the societal attributes of power and there we need to understand that power does not rest with the individual. When we see the relationship between say a doctor or a patient or a teacher or the student, father or a son, now that particular moment when power is exercised is the effect of the power. Power is already always there in the structure, it is a part of social structure, it has a societal attribute. So, power does not rest in the individual as many theorists have argued, where they see power as the structural with societal dimensions or attributes. So, Hannah Arendt is one such example, she talks about power as attributes of collective that is enabled through communication among or between the people. So, she viewed power in a slightly positive sense, not merely as a negative. So, power also enables, power also strengthen the groups or the collectivities to do something, to get something done. It is not just about domination of one over the other, but also it has some positive attributes through which it enables the groups or the collectivities 
to do something to ensure say rule of law to ensure justice to ensure social equi equity or uh, uh, any good that particular collectivities decide for themselves so she viewed power in a slightly positive sense that power makes an individual act like a responsible or accountable or moral being in the society so power has also this positive dimension so in this sense power is not always as power over whether it is a individual over another individual or group of individual over another individual or a group over the another groups so power is not always understood as power over but also power to that group or individual or group of individuals come together not to dominate the other or to establish one its domination over the other but also to achieve something to do something that is creative that is noble that is uh, uh, to ensure peace or justice or social equity in the society so power has the both negative or positive attributes now talcott parsons defines power or political power through two dimensions basically so he equates the power in political system or in society as performing the role of money as it does in the sphere of economy so talcott persons um, define political power through two dimensions first the facilitative form of power so those who yield power those who enjoy power they get certain things done in that political system and another is the systemic form of power so power is already structured it's systemic and those who like in the economic sphere uh, those who have the money they get to buy more they get to uh, participate in the economic sphere more and money and ownership of money possession of money enables or facilitates certain services in the economic sphere similarly those who uh, yields power or own power get certain things done in the systemic form of power in the society so he pointed out that power is something that circulates in society like money in the economy somewhat similar but of course radically different interpretation of power we will discuss when we will discuss michel fuku so talcott person talks about power in a systemic sense which operates like money operates in the economy he argued that acquisition of power enhances human capacity or ability to secure political obligation so the power is something which provides same function or has same attributes as money has in the sphere of economy now we'll move on to discuss steven luke's three dimensional view of power and uh, steven luke's acknowledged and argued about the essentially contested conception of power however he provides the most comprehensive and radical understanding of power and this understanding of power is regarded as a three dimensional view so power operates at three levels first at the top where power is most explicit so power at the top is most explicit where you will find that uh, there are two groups who fight with uh, each other and those who uh, who is the winner get the say or prevails over the another so the exercise of power is most explicit and visible at the top level when there is two group which fight each other and one of them prevail over the other so for example hypothetically let's take bjp or the congress fighting each other in the election and we know after the election which party win so it's like very explicit uh, level so that's the hypothetical example but in other circumstances or conditions also power at the top is most visible or explicit when you have two groups fighting each other and one of them prevail over the other so power at the most explicit 
level at the top level where it prevails or exercised to ensure that a more authoritative powerful or dominant interests prevail over the other so one group is clearly winner and the other group is clearly loser and that is mostly uh, explicit at the top level so power is visible only at the top and most visible only at the top at the second level where power is less obvious that means it operates but it's not that visible as it is at the top so how it operates power at the less obvious level that is at the second level operates when some ideas or issues are kept out of the agenda of discussions and debates so now power also operates here but here it is less visible less explicit than it is at the top so some ideas or issues are kept outside the agenda of discussions and debates so uh, the government want see media they will not discuss certain issues so what we often see on media debates or channels are already a structure in a way so power operates while setting the agenda of discussion itself and uh, on some agendas which the party or the government may like us to discuss view debate and all are already set by them so power operates here but it is less visible less explicit than uh, it is at the top level so here power is exercised while setting the agenda itself so some issues some um, ideas will be kept outside the agenda of discussion so, so for example for a very long time farmer issue is not debated as some other issues are debated or other uh, many pressing issues so for example let's take the example of lgbt communities and their rights and demands for a very long time it was suppressed or kept outside the mainstream media and so on so many documentary filmmakers and many others they might be doing it but in the large public mainstream media some issues some ideas some points will be kept outside the agenda of discussion and debates now power at the third level is the most radical form of power and yet it is here that power is most effective that is called most radical view of power is power at the grassroots level here power is structural in nature and works in different ways to shape the perception of people and these people are those over whom power is exercised or uh, ruled is based or the dominant class or the ruling class gets the legitimacy from these people by making themselves subject of their ideology or um, uh, supporter of their policies and programs so power at the grassroots level is very diverse and structural which uh, ensure or which shapes the perception of the people and at this level power is most effective and the real interest of the people so the large masses of the people or the common masses of the people which they think or they mobilize their opinion they exercise their views or thought they most of the time the real interest of um, these people are kept hidden and they discuss debate and express their opinion on the issues our agenda that is set for them by the dominant or the ruling class so power at this grassroots level is most effective and yet most invisible people feel they are free to express their opinion to choose their parties to express their opinion on any particular social political and economic issue but here they are the subject of power in the most invisible uh, sense so uh, the way power operates at the grassroots level are very varied very structural but it shapes the perception of people about a party or a group or an ideology and so on so power at the third level is most structural most effective and yet least visible it's almost invisible and people feel that they are free but or autonomous but yet they are shaped by the power relation of 
the dominant ruling class. So, these are the three dimensional view of power where you see power is most visible at the top, less visible at the second level where some issues are kept outside the agenda and most effective and yet least visible at the grassroots level which shapes the perception of the people through different ways in the structural sense. So, power is most effective at the third level. So, these are the Stephen Luke's understanding of power which help you to understand the power relationship or power structure in any society or a country. Now, uh, to move on this idea of authority which we often see as uh, used in ordinary discourse interchangeably that means power and authority is seen as uh, one and the same thing. However, there is a great uh, deal of difference between the two. Authority is generally understood as power which has legal basis. So, in contrast to power which is about capability or the strength to do something done, in contrast to that power, uh, authority is seen as those power which has some legal basis. So, for example, police or a judge or an army, they all exercise power, but that exercise of power is backed up by some legal basis. In contrast to that, let us take the example of say robbers or those who are antisocials or those who are, uh, you know, um, overthrowing the state through uh, violence. They also exercise the power, but their power do not have the uh, sanction of the law or the legal basis. So, in other words, orders, commands or guidelines which have legal sanctions are regarded as authority. So, authority is the legitimate power, let us put it that way. So, power which is legitimate is regarded as the authority but however, power can be of different nature also. Now, uh, to understand the authority in modern times, Max Weber, German sociologist have pointed out three different kinds of authority. One is rational bureaucratic authority, traditional authority and the charismatic authority. So, let us uh, discuss these forms of authority or kinds of authority one by one. The rational bureaucratic authority refers to the modern bureaucratic state. So, the bureaucracy in the modern state are the representative of this rational uh, bureaucratic authority, where it uh, describes how power is exercised through different institutions of government through two things, impersonal rules on rational grounds. So, the power a bureaucracy exercise is based on the rules which is impersonal unlike say monarchy, where uh, uh, the rule, power and authority is very much personalized or seen as an extension of the personhood of the king. Here in the rational bureaucratic model, the rule is impersonal. That means, the bureaucrat who actually exercise the power, uh, the power which he exercise is not because of his own personhood, but he represents some legality or some laws or some rules of the state. So, the nature of power that is exercised by a bureaucrat in the modern bureaucratic or rational bureaucratic authority is impersonal and it must satisfy the rational uh, grounds. Now, the traditional authorities has its basis in the historical and cultural ways of society. So, say for example, the authority of a tribal chief is based on this historical or the cultural ways of his society. So, that is traditional form of authority. The third that is charismatic authority, which rests on the personal attributes and characteristics of the leaders, who may not or may have, usually may not have the official position or uh, being traditional or cultural. So, they do not have any traditional or the cultural backup, neither they have any official position and yet because of their personal characteristics or attributes, they enjoy enormous popularity, or they, uh, they enjoy enormous authority in their country and society. So, the examples of say Jesus, Muhammad, Gandhi, Hitler or many such uh, leaders are the example of charismatic authority who may not exercise any official position, who may not have any 
uh, historical or the cultural legacy and yet they are able to enjoy enormous authority over their people. So, these are the three kinds of authority, uh, rational, bureaucratic, uh, which is reflected in modern bureaucratic state, is based on the impersonal rules and the rational grounds. Traditional authority based on the historical and the cultural ways of the society and charismatic authority is based on the attributes and characteristic of an individual leader. So, uh, however, Weber regarded these three types of authority as ideal types helpful for the analytical purpose. So, it is not real that you may have only one type of authority in a society. So, it is po quite possible that in reality society may have a mix of two or more and all three kinds of authority. So, you may have a person who is very charismatic, yet uh, he has certain cultural and historical legacy or he or she may also enjoy certain official position or the bureaucratic position. So, you may find in the real situation these uh, three kinds of authorities are only ideal type that is used by Weber uh, to, to analyze, to study authority in particular society, but in the real society you may find the combination of two forms of authority or maybe all forms of authority within a society. Authority makes claim of power and exercise it through persuasion. So, that is the way authority functions. It takes resort to coercive means as a last resort. So, the very definition or understanding of authority is based on some form of legitimacy. So, the authority is equal to legitimate power, right. So, it is based on both legitimacy and consent. So, authority is also understood as of two kind de facto and de jure. Now, de jure authority is a form of authority that has legal basis. However, the de facto authority refers to an authority which actually exercise power like the establishment of military coup or military rule over the democratically elected uh, government. So, in a society or in a country where you have a situation where the elected government are uh, replaced by military coup. In that situation, you have uh, the elected government which is the de jure authority, where the actual exercise of power and authority is in the hand of military or uh, those who uh, uh, replace the uh, democratically elected government. So, you have then this uh, differentiation between de facto or the de jure form of authority. Now, let us discuss uh, this uh, relationship between power and authority. So, it is considered that power and authority are contradictory in nature. So, many uh, people argue that power is something that is about uh, the uh, relations between or among the individuals which is shaped by the uh, structural uh, nature of that society. So, the relationship between upper caste or the lower caste, men or the women, teacher or the student, doctor or the patient are all shaped through the structural nature of the power. Authority on the other hand is seen as something which has legitimate uh, power or which exercise legitimate uh, power and therefore, it is often seen as contradictory to each other. Power is often identified with constraint. So, when we invoke the uh, term power, we often refer to some kind of constraint, some kind of control, some kind of regulation or force or dependence or subordination that explains the relationship of domination and subjugation or subjection. Whereas, authority is about seeking consent and it is based on righteousness of action. So, the legitimacy and the consent is something that defines the existence of authority or the power that in authority or the legitimate authority exercise. However, some political thinkers believe that both power and authority are nearly impossible to separate because it is seen that in any kind of state or institutions, both power and authority exercise. So, an authority is effective only when it has the means to back up its policies and plan to implement it effectively. 
So, uh, the simultaneous presence of power and authority therefore, is necessary for the proper or the effective working of any institutions of a state. So, power and authority in that sense complement each other in the effective functioning of the state and its institution. For example, A. Carter in her work Authority and Democracy pointed out that authority rarely exists in its pure form. That means, no authority exercises or duly perform its functions in the pure form. She also said that even a constitutional government acting in the most liberal manner would still lack pure authority since such governments relies ultimately upon coercion. So, the coercive nature of the state and its institution defies this idea of authority as devoid of power or a kind of pure form of authority which is based on the legitimacy and consent and therefore, there is a no need of coercive element. So, modern state by design has also some coercive apparatus in the form of police or army or paramilitary forces or the prison to coerce the people to implement its law when it is opposed by some groups or the community. So, the uh, most uh, uh, liberal or the constitutional government may also have coercive element to it. So, it is impossible to have authority as understood as legitimate institution based on the consent of the people and therefore, does not require any coercive uh, means are merely uh, ideal. In the real uh, world, you need to have uh, simultaneous presence of authority and power. Carl J. Frederick argued that authority involves reasoning and he said that it this is not the reasoning of mathematics and logic, but the reasoning which relates actions to opinion and beliefs to values however defined. So, it can thus argue to be in contrast to analysis of power. So, the basis or legitimacy of authority rests on the reasoning which is different from the reasoning in mathematics and logic, where the beliefs and the opinions which are diverse, which uh, are the reason for contest in any society and yet these beliefs and opinions forms the basis for the legitimacy of any, uh, any authority. So, some theorists have argued that authority is philosophical concept and power is something which is sociological concept. So, we see, we observe the exercise of power or the functioning of power or what we can also say the effect of power in the society, where authority is something which is more philosophical in nature or analytical in nature. So, power in contrast to authority which is seen as philosophical concept is seen as sociological concept that is based on observation of power relationships and the ways it operates in the society. So, the social scientists involved in the study of power will look at the structure of the society and try to understand or observe the, its exercise, whereas the authority is something which uh, requires some philosophical or analytical approach to the exercise of an authority or the existence or legitimacy of an authority. So, social scientist basically focuses on the empirical studies of political decisions making and the ways a state functions. So, it emphasized on the roles of power elites that dominate over people through their policies or decisions on varied social economic issues in the society. So, authority is dependent on reasoning, rules and rightfulness. It cannot be based simply on coercion or command and obedience relationship like that exist in the power relationship. So, in power relationship is always about command or order or some forms of obedience that is a priori uh, decided. So, for the example of uh, the relationship between say father or a son or a teacher or a student or husband uh, and a wife these relationship of power assumes certain obedience, certain command beforehand. So, authority is different from that where it is dependent on reasoning, rules and rightfulness. So, in contrast to power, authority describes rightfulness and legitimacy and at the same time, it talks about loss of liberty or freedom 
because under an authoritative state the free choices of individual are reduced to reduced or limited to a great extent. So, many liberals have argued uh, that the authority is something which curves the individual freedom. So, uh, it is better to have minimum authority or the authority which is weak and therefore, uh, they argue that uh, if the authorities are weak or uh, you know minimum, then individual enjoy maximum freedom. So, the relationship between the scope of freedom that an individual enjoy is in direct proportion to the existence or the power that an authority exercises. So, the relationship between authority and freedom is seen as a kind of contradictory to each other. However, many uh, republicans and others have argued that authorities are some institutions which provide the condition for the exercise of individual freedom. However, the liberals argued that the authorities are actually uh, some institution which curbs, which limits the freedom one exercise, no matter how reasonable or how rightful the existence of authorities are, it is seen in the classical liberal uh, philosophy at least as a limit to the individual free will or freedom. So, there are rules or laws that authorizes or give authority to certain individual to make decisions regarding socio-economic or moral issues. So, for example, officials of the legal system like judges, lawyers, police, military officials, ministers, etc. These individuals have legitimate authority and they exercise power on the basis of the rules of the state. So, their exercise of power is based or guided or sanctioned by the rules of the state and therefore, the exercise of power by the police or the judge or the militaries are seen as legitimate uh, power or authority. So, thus the uh, rightfulness is considered as the basis of authority unlike power which can be exercised or operated in society by force or coercion. So, the uh, relationship between authority and power can be also seen as authority which is legitimate or based on the consent of people, power in contrast to that is about force or coercion. However, it is very difficult to ascertain the difference between power and authority and there are critics who believe that there is no agreement on the concept of power and therefore, it is regarded as an essentially contested concept. So, uh, authority without the back of a power or without having the capacity or means to implement its decision is not beneficial for the country, for the society. So, it uh, requires the exercise of uh, power or the coercive nature of a state are example of such requirements where a state and its legitimacy is uh, backed up by the coercive dimension of modern state or its monopoly of violence. So, one cannot uh, uh, separate uh, the power and the authority, both go uh, at times hand in hand and um, some forms of power may destabilize the authority and that requires uh, you know some kind of transition. So, for example, the nationalist movement. So, the national popular will represented by Congress party or led by many of its uh, leaders including some leaders from other parties, they all question the authority of the British imperial rule in India. Now, after the replacement of that rule, the national popular will represented by Congress party and the many other parties became the de facto authority or de jure authority as well after the enactment of the constitution. So, those kind of struggle between power and authority you may often uh, find or uh, observe in the society, yet there are some analytical distinctions between authority and power which we have discussed uh, in this lecture, but nonetheless the very understanding or definition of power is far from settled. That means, it is essentially contested. Uh, concepts and which we will discuss in next two lectures about different conception of power. So, the themes that I have discussed today uh, in this lecture, 
you can refer to some of these books like uh, Norman Berry an introduction to modern political theory this text will give you the detailed uh, description about the relationship between power and authority similarly you can refer to Nivita Menon's chapter on power in Rajiv Bhargav and Ashoka Acharya and you can similarly refer to some of these books to understand some of the topics which we have discussed today so thanks for listening that is all for today thank you all